Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, The Challenges of Creating an Autonomous Digital Human with Digital Domain. My name is Krish Patel, and on behalf of NVIDIA and the speakers, I want to thank you for joining this exciting webinar, where we'll go behind the scenes with Digital Domain to see how they render real-time, lifelike, autonomous digital humans. We'll be joined by Doug Robel and Matthias Whitman from Digital Domain and Rick Champagne from NVIDIA. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a live Q&A session. Then tomorrow, look out for an email with the webinar recording. Everyone who attends the webinar today is also entered in a drawing to win an NVIDIA Quadro RTX 5000. At the bottom of your screen, there are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable. All attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. Please submit your questions through the Q&A widget anytime during or after the presentation. Our panelists will be answering your questions throughout the webinar. Some additional information is available in the resource list. And before we begin, I'm excited to announce NVIDIA GTC will happen online April 12th through 16th. GTC is the premier conference for AI innovators, technologists, and creatives. Really anyone that is looking to build new skills and forge new connections to take on the world's biggest challenges. And it's free to attend. Visit nvidia.com slash GTC to register for free sessions. All right, let's get started. I'll now turn it over to Rick to begin the presentation. Thank you so much, Kush. Really appreciate it, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. So in the media and entertainment industry, we've been tackling this believable characters challenge for a very long time, and we're now seeing humans in movies and TV shows that go well beyond what we'd consider believable, in fact, and some of which are near indistinguishable from the real thing. But we're now moving into an era of digital humans that takes us from you know, modeling, rigging, animating, to creating completely autonomous digital humans. So let me get into some of that. Uh, this next leap, of course, in digital human evolution is a massive one, and we're faced with an entirely new set of challenges. You're going to hear about them on the webinar today. And to create an, an autonomous digital human, there are many new ingredients necessary to get us there. So, for example, there's natural language processing, or NLP, that analyzes the user's voice, generates words, determining intent and speech quality. And we need speech synthesis to translate text to spoken words and facilitate communication between humans and computers. Uh, a digital human needs to be able to choose the best responses during a conversation and even uh, the context of the situation or environment that... Uh, that it's in. And uh, does your digital human also need to recognize your words or your users when they come back? Uh, does it need to remember their last conversation? And so there are also a lot of computer vision tasks like um, including uh, object detection, facial recognition, classification, segmentation, you know, you see a lot of them here, sentiment ana analysis, you know, how's the person feeling, um, and basically automating tasks that the human visual system can do. And so, of course, all of these complex Come with, uh, uh, that come with making a digital human look and behave like a real human. So digital uh, domain is actually going to dive deeper into some of these challenges for us. And so I'm excited to hear more from them on that. Uh, deep learning has also come a long way. There, there's a lot of research going on. Uh, you, you see here, it's, uh, it's called character concepting in, in this example, but really it's a generative adversarial neural network that's learned to synthesize uh, virtual characters of any artistic genre, and it can even do photorealistic, of course. I'm sure you've all seen some of, the, some of that type of work. Um, the next one is audio-driven facial animation, so we can actually animate uh, a face based on, a, on an audio file. We have character locomotion of uh, an infinite number of positions, so this, uh, this one can negotiate arbitrary paths and obstacles. We can also reconstruct 3D from video now, uh, and that's showing a lot of promise already. Uh, the next one is a deep learning model that learned the physics behavior of cloth animation, and it can actually even upsample low-res cloth sim to add wrinkles, folds, and details. And then the last one, by now you, you're all familiar with our optics denoiser, I'm sure, and it can accelerate things like ray tracing uh, in a way that reduces the number of rays that need to be cast and, of course, uh, fewer pixels that need to be uh, rendered. So let me just keep moving here. Uh, and then, um, you know, we have a complete set of solutions uh, for complex problems in, in this domain. Uh, so for conversational characters, we can use AI to, to bring life to your creation. And so you can build, train, and deploy GPU-accelerated 
conversational AIs. And the first one here is just NVIDIA Jarvis. It's an application framework for multimodal conversational AI services, and it delivers real-time performance on GPUs naturally. Uh, and the SDK has several base modules for high-performance tasks like speech recognition, intent recognition, text-to-speech, pose estimation, gaze detection, facial landmark detection, and it does it all through a, a simple uh, API. And Jarvis knows who's speaking and it can even know what they're doing. Uh, it's also capable of simultaneous multi-user, multi-context conversations uh, without having to split off to different services. And then when you're ready to customize the models for your specific use case, there's Nemo. And it can, you know, starting with a pre-trained, uh, with pre-trained models for um, auto speech recognition, natural language understanding, text to speech. Uh, you can actually create your own custom model to handle domain-specific interactions. So anything from understanding words in a fictitious language to knowing the complete, uh, uh, the complete world history of a, a film franchise. And so Nemo lets you make those uh, necessary additions. Audio to Face, I mentioned, uh, it's a network designed and trained to animate the vertices of a 3D character model based on listening to audio in real time. Uh, we we announced we showed some of that with uh, NVIDIA Omniverse, so if you go nvidia.com slash omniverse, you can find out more there. Um, and then moving over, we also have um, uh, NVIDIA Merlin, which is an end-to-end -end recommendation system. And so recommender systems are really the engine of the personalized internet, and they're on online everywhere already, uh, but they suggest food you might like, uh, offer items related to your purchases, they can capture your interest uh, in the moment during a conversation in real time. And so that's all very uh, exciting stuff too. So Merlin uh, has a collection of libraries that includes tools for building uh, deep learning based systems to provide better predictions for people. So uh, all important stuff when you have a uh, digital human that you're talking to. And so each stage of the pipeline is optimized uh, to support hundreds of terabytes of data, so massive data lake uh, can be applied here, and it's all accessible, again, through easy use APIs. And if your digital humans or characters uh, are to be experienced in the physical world via robotics, we have Isaac Sim, which leverages NVIDIA Omniverse, and that's the next gen of uh, robotics and AI simulator. And it provides really uh, high-fidelity, stable, fast, GPU-enabled physics. Uh, with PhysX, uh, NVIDIA PhysX, and then it has real-time photorealistic multi-GPU ray tracing and path tracing uh, of really high-fidelity simulation for 3D worlds. And then you can connect uh, the brain to the virtual world through the Isaac SDK. And then you see here Isaac Gym, which is NVIDIA's physics simulation environment for reinforcement learning uh, research. And then lastly, there are, uh, we have computer vision pipelines for image and video processing, like Maxine, which includes APIs for tasks like face alignment, gaze correction, face relighting, and uh, real-time translation, um, in addition to capabilities like super resolution, uh, noise removal, closed captioning, and virtual assistant. So really you can reduce video bandwidth usage down to one-tenth of H.264. Uh, you definitely have to see the demo of that. It's really, uh, really awesome. It uses AI video compression. And then, uh, again, uh, all of this is optimized for NVIDIA GPUs. I'm just going to keep moving here so we can get to the heart of the show. Um, so to manage all of it, of course, we announced the NVIDIA Ampere GPU architecture last year, late last year, and it includes our second generation of NVIDIA RTX. Uh, with that, um, you know, it really built on the success of Turing with, a, with, um, with more than double the number of CUDA cores in some cases for programmable shading and compute. Uh, the next gen of RT cores to accelerate ray tracing, including now the addition of motion blur, uh, in hardware, and then uh, the third generation of tensor cores, which accelerates the AI uh, processing pipeline. And so uh, this is what it looks like in the NVIDIA RTX A6000, which we announced in, in December. Um, and this is where it all comes to life. So really, this is our most powerful GPU for visual, uh, for uh, workstation GPU for visual computing, and we continuously evolve. And there's been a great advancement, of course, with every architecture, and each, but uh, each gen doesn't just include more memory uh, and performance, uh, but it also has unique hardware features. Uh, you can see some of the highlights here from, you know, double the throughput with floating point 32 over previous gen, with double the throughput um, uh, with, uh, with ray tracing over previous gen. 
and then uh, up to five times uh, the throughput with TensorFlow 32 and 10x with sparsity turned on, and then, of course, double the memory of the 6000 class that we had previously. Uh, that's ECC memory, and then PCIe Gen 4, which provides double the bandwidth over PCIe Gen 3. So that's just uh, some of the things I want to touch on real quick. I'm going to turn it over now to Digital Domain. We have Doug Robel, the Senior Director of Software R&D for Digital Domain, and Matthias Whitman, Visual Effects Supervisor for Digital Domain, and they're going to take us through um, some really cool new innovations that are going on uh, in their Digital Humans team. So with that, I'll pass it over to Doug. Hello, NVIDIA. Um, and it's great to be talking with you. Today we're going to be talking all about how to create an autonomous virtual human that uh, kind of behaves like a real person. Um, my name is Doug Robel. I'm the head of software at Digital Domain. I've been there for approaching 30 years, actually around 28 years now. And I have worked on an enormous amount of stuff while I've been there. I started out in computer vision, then I transferred to fluid simulation and physical simulation. And over the last uh, decade or so, I've been moving towards all things characters. And over the last six years, I've been forcing everyone in the software department to look at problems through the lens of machine learning. And that has led to uh, a lot of fun stuff that's come out of digital domain. And um, it's been great. I have not been doing this alone. I, there is a great team of software developers and artists at Digital Domain who have been putting amazing things together. And joining me on this NVIDIA webinar is my colleague, Matthias. Matthias, introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Matthias Wittmann. I'm at Digital Domain. Uh, I started Digital Domain in 2004 uh, as an animator. And uh, in 2008, I started specializing on facial animation and in realistic human facial animation with Benjamin Button. I was in uh, the animation lead and I was very, very strongly involved also creating this facial rig for it. So um, for the following years, I was really only mainly doing this. Then uh, game engines became more and more available for regular people like me and like Unity and Unreal. And it was really interesting for me to see how much you can do with interactive uh, engines like those. And in 2014, I switched over to, from that point on, only focusing on making really realistic, interactive, responsive virtual humans for AR, VR, and now also for Zoom sessions. So, Today, we're going to talk, the, the title of this talk is The Challenges of Creating an Autonomous Visual Human. And um, as you can see, we're not alone. We've got my digital doppelganger. We call him Douglas here to avoid confusion with me. Um, uh, is going to be joining us in participating in this conversation or this uh, webinar. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit and 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 basically this webinar is going to be a conversation between me and Matthias and we're going to talk about all the things that we've learned while we were putting the autonomous version of me together and some of the challenges that still remain because this is definitely a work in progress is this thing finished Matthias no, no, no. I mean, every time we add something to the system, we see, oh my God, this opens a can of worms for the thousands of other things we need to still develop. But a lot of things are in a base way existing already. So a lot of things where we thought, can we even do this? Oh, it kind of works. Okay, let's move on to the next thing before we refine that. Uh, let's look into other issues. Yeah. And as we've been doing this, I've been paying more and more attention to how people talk to each other. And there is an enormous amount of subtlety and detail. And, well, we're going to talk a lot about all, all those things. So the way this, is, uh, kind of, uh, this talk is going to work is that first, we're going to spend a lot of time doing a sort of introduction to where we are right now, uh, introduction to Douglas. And we'll show you some of the cool things that he can do, and you'll get a sense of what 
you know, where, where he needs work. And then after that, we're going to have sort of a wide ranging conversation about um, the challenges that still exist. And then after that, we're going to have uh, questions and answers. So we'll answer any questions that you have. Um, we're doing this pre-recorded because we wanted, well, first of all, the NVIDIA webinar thing wouldn't support Douglas at this point. And, um, but we're here at the webinar. And so as you watch this, think about questions that you'd like to ask, and then we'll answer them at the end. All right. So. Matthias, uh, what what were we trying to do with this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, first we sat there and said we make an autonomous virtual human, but we had to first define what what makes an autonomous virtual human actually, uh, and what what is it? And there's the one side, it has to look like a human. It's digital domain. We make visual effects. We are very visual driven actually, so it should look as human like as possible. Um, still running in a real-time engine, it should behave like a human. I'm from animation. For me, that's very important. It should actually not just stand there, look pretty, and then move the mouth. It should somehow behave like a human being. And then there's the real technical, difficult part of it has to also be able to communicate with us in real time. And that is a real challenge. That is really hard. Um, and on top of all that, we, we set ourselves a really high bar. So instead of uh, creating a character that uh, just you know, out of whole cloth, what we wanted to do was try to create a character of somebody who actually exists. And this is the big challenge. He is supposed to look like me and move like me and sound like me. And so we were really trying to, to push the envelope. And in fact, he's in the same Zoom call as me. So you can go and move your eyes and you can go, okay, that's not the same. That's not the same. I'm deliberately wearing a blue shirt here so that uh, you know maybe there's a little confusion going on. But um, uh, you can see it's um, right off the bat, he looks pretty good, but I've lost weight. My my face is a little skinnier than it was when I got scanned uh, back in 2017. So um, that's interesting as well. <laughs> yeah, Doug is um, wearing a blue shirt today. I'm wearing different T-shirts because you will see we record this on different days. <laughs> and it will yeah, from time to time. <laughs> yep. Putting together a recording, uh, especially with an autonomous character, it requires uh, some takes and stuff like that. So the, the clothing might have changed. Uh, we're not trying to hide anything. It was just more for our convenience. We are very, very careful, actually, in, in showing all these clips you see in one piece, We uh, especially when we go through demos and stuff, because we don't want to fake anything. And how quick is he reacting? What is he doing then? And then that's all legit. Everything you see there, we could do right away live. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, one caveat there, one of the problems with uh, Zoom calls is lip sync. Um, the, the lip sync on this is important for us, but sometimes uh, the lip sync with Zoom gets a little wobbly. Um, we'll roll with it, you know, that's all right. All right, so why are we doing this? Why did we do this? Well, first of all, we, we did it mostly because this is what we do. Uh, we were, we're a visual effects company, and since Benjamin Button, we've been trying to create digital characters that uh, the audience believes in. And, um, and as movies went on, we'd get better and better and better. And, and then I, at one point, we basically said, hey, real-time technology and machine learning has made this possible to run in real time. And so we did the TED Talk where we tried to create a character that looked like me. And then after that, it was a natural thing to sort of say, well, I don't want to have to do all this motion capture, I, you know, put on the real-time tracking stuff in order to control the character. Maybe we could create a character that, that moved by itself. But there's more to this than that, right? Matthias, what, what, uh, why else are we doing this? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, and we were asked this a lot while doing this, why are you guys doing this? I mean, look around us, it's, it's, everything is becoming computerized. There are computers here and there and everywhere in cars and your house. And in every instance, there is some kind of a computer. And some of them 
have programs that are quite nice and easy understandable and they have user interfaces that are uh, that are good to use for anyone but so and so many are really not and each is slightly different and you kind of have to learn everything all over uh, when, with a new computer and anything and now we thought um, the ideal interface obviously would be a person a person is a person what is easier than talking to another one another person to to execute something i know right when you get confused the first thing you do is call up customer support right and you try to talk to a person about your computer exactly so um obviously we're not there yet but we are on a really good way on doing this and and i don't want to even talk about the challenge of uh, how can we combine everything around us with this one interface but one step after another right now we try to make a really nice functioning communication um, um, with the computer here. So that leads us to, you know, what has to happen here. So obviously this is this is better than just a, a graphical user interface. It's something where, you know, everybody's been using their phones and they, they press a button and something doesn't happen. And you're like, well, what do I do now? Well, here's a person that you could actually ask, well, what do I do now? And then it very well may know the answer to that. But in order to make this better than pushing buttons, it's that that feedback, that visual and verbal cues that you get with communicating. Because not only it communication is so deep, there's the words that you're saying, but how you're saying it, and what's going on with your body when you're saying it, and it's, we've all talked to people who have a smile on their face when they're saying something sad. And you realize that something very complicated is going on inside their bodies. And that the thing that they're saying is, it has a lot of meaning to them. And that's all done with the visual and the listening and the everything going on. It's not just the words. And putting a character like this guy onto the, the an interface for a computer it opens up that whole thing. It could get really fun. I hope it doesn't make it too more complicated. I don't know. Is this going to work? in the is. We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> so at this point, we've talked enough. Um, what we're going to do is go through a little bit of a demo of how the autonomous version of me works. Um, and the this is something that we put together uh, to show off some of the features that he has. Um, it's interacting with a character like this is um, a little different than talking to just anybody because it's uh, still a work in progress. And so this will show you the sort of cadence of the communication and the the powers and the, the, the fun stuff that you can do with this character. Uh, like I said, we've recorded this in a separate thing. We're going to do a little cut here, but then we're just going to jump right into the introduction and um, off we go. Hey, Douglas. Give me the intro. I'd love to teach you how I work. If you want to skip my introduction, just say skip introduction. See the menu in the top right hand corner. This is my memory. Try it out now by telling me your name. My name is Doug. Nice to meet you, Doug. When you speak to me, I will wait for you to stop speaking before I respond. So please pause for a moment after you are finished speaking. Let's try it now. What is your favorite color, Doug? My favorite color is purple. Great. I like purple too. Oh, by the way, if you prefer subtitles, you can activate them by saying switch subtitles on. Let's try it. Ask me to switch subtitles on. Switch subtitles on. Well done, Doug. Check out the symbol in the lower left corner. When it is blue, it means I'm listening to you speaking. When it is red, it means that I'm busy with responding. If you would like to switch my location, just say switch location. Try it now. Switch location. That looks nice. See what just happened. 
you can switch to a different environment at any time by saying switch location. And that's not all. Tell me to switch my face. Switch your face. Okay. Isn't that amazing? With the right train, I could switch to look like anyone. I like to go back to my normal face, though. I can find out any fact. Just start your sentence with tell me. For example, try tell me the weather in Burbank or tell me how far away the moon is. Tell me the weather in San Jose, California. Currently in San Jose, it's 70 and sunny. Today, it'll be sunny with a forecasted high of 72 and a low of 42. Not bad, right? But after all of that, you may prefer just a casual conversation. In that case, simply say, let's talk. Or say thanks, Douglas, when you're finished speaking with me. Thanks, Douglas. All right. So now you've met the autonomous version of me. And um, hopefully you uh, saw some of the cool stuff that he can do. And also, you know, uh, some of the stuff that needs some work. Um, there is a lot of stuff that's going on to try to make him work the way he does. Hey, Douglas, what has to happen for you to be alive? Hey, Douglas, what has to happen for you to be alive? Well, Doug, what I'm saying is being driven by multiple conversational agents. I have a speech recognition system so I can hear you. I have a speech synthesis system so I sound like Doug. I have a vision system so I can identify who is talking to me. I have sentiment analysis to control how I deliver my lines. That's a lot of stuff. I'm not finished. I was just catching my breath. My shirt is a machine learning cloth simulation. I'm being rendered with the latest real-time ray tracing in Unreal. And I have a custom neural rendering layer on top of that for extra realism. Thanks, Douglas. So what makes up a conversation? Um, think about what he was just doing in that introduction and what we just did right there. Um, first of all, he can see and hear us. That's really important. It's a part of a good conversation. And not only that, when he sees us, he remembers us. So this is all being done through Zoom. There's a computer vision system there that's watching what's going on, and he is associating names with faces. But there's even more, right, Matthias? Oh, yeah. He is not just uh, figuring out what to answer to you next. He's actually analyzing his whole answer. And according to that, he is changing his overall motion, his voice, his facial uh, animation. He becomes more happy, more angry, depending on what he figured out is the appropriate sentiment of this answer. Yeah. And just think about the next time you were having a conversation with somebody, whether it's in person or on Zoom, and just watch what all the little details that go on in terms of a good conversation. But not only that, we've put on some cool stuff that he can do that we can't do. Like, we can change his appearance at the, at the turn of a hat. You know, it's it just like, boom, it changes his appearance. And he can be in different locations uh, as, as easy as that. Um, but... It's even more. We can. We have to program him to tell us things, right? How do we control what he says, Matthias? Well, I mean, he's control. He told us himself just right now that he has multiple chatbots. Actually, he's using for determining the answer. But you know, Doug, all this stuff is is really nice, and he's doing all these things. And we went through this nicely scripted intro, and he was following. Uh, he told us how he's working and all these things, and that's all very clear. But people usually don't follow these strict rules very nicely. So we had to really think about how do we handle actual people that don't follow a script? Can he be interrupted in the middle of the sentence? Can he find his way back to what he actually wanted to tell us after he was interrupted? And, and would he listen forever, or, or is he just 
would he maybe recognize if someone is not talking to him anymore? So there are really a couple of other issues that we will showcase now a little bit in our second demo. Hey, Douglas. Give me the intro. I'd love to teach you how I work. If you want to skip my introduction, just say skip introduction. See the menu in the top right hand corner. This is my memory. You can see that I already memorized you as Doug. When you speak to me, I will wait for you to stop speaking before I respond. So please pause for a moment after you are finished speaking. Let's try it now. Even though I already know that your favorite color is purple, I still would like to ask you again. What is your favorite color, Doug? My favorite color is yellow. Great. I like yellow too. Oh, by the way, if you prefer subtitles, you can activate them by saying switch Tell subtitles. Tell me the weather in San Francisco. Right now in San Francisco, it's 69 and sunny. Today, it'll be sunny with a forecasted high of 72 and a low of 47. That's really nice weather. It really is. I like to go to the beach and surf. What about you? Actually, to get back to what I was just saying, let's try it. Ask me to switch subtitles on. Switch subtitles on. Well done, Doug. Check out the symbol in the lower left corner. When it is blue, it means I'm listening to you speaking. When it is red, it means that I am busy with responding. If you would like to switch my location, just say switch location. Try it now. Skip intro. So how can I help you? Thanks, Douglas. And cut. So now you can see an attempt at the different kinds of problems that happen in conversations, uh, the interruptions, the, the stuff that's going on. And in fact, um, all of this is being driven by chatbot technology. And um, this is one of the things that we bring. It, you can't just take a chatbot and assume that it's going to work with this guy. Um, in fact, we have taken multiple chatbots. Hey, Douglas. How do your bots work? I currently have three chatbots running, an assistant, a scripted chatbot, and a conversational AI, which get fed the user's statement. Then we have a method to determine which answer is most appropriate. Have you ever said anything that is inappropriate? Not that I can think of. What do you do for a living if you don't mind me asking? Thanks, Douglas. Even though he's a little shy, he has definitely said some things that are inappropriate. <laughs> this is one of the challenges of having a conversational AI and running alongside something that's much more scripted. And we are still struggling with that. Um, but beyond that, there's all sorts of other things that go into a conversation. Like, um, Matisse, what else do we see back there? Maybe you have noticed in the last video, in our last demo, that Douglas now knew Doug already, and he was referring to him with that. And also, you, you saw also how we used the memorized favorite color of Doug. He is also using that for a different response there. So it was still running through the same scripted intro that we used the first time, and yet it sounded differently. And he did other things there because they were context aware now. So it's all, as Doug said, it's very dependent on how you actually um, use those bots that are existing and how far you can use them. So there's a lot of tweaking outside, there's a lot of tweaking inside, but the whole idea is to keep it more realistic and more believable because ah, this guy knows me now. Sure, he talks to me different now. Indeed. And, and going back to some of the realism, you saw that I was able to interrupt him, right? And he even does this little the sort of you know annoyed glance. That was actually my behavior. Uh, in fact, we had me in the motion capture suit 
um, Matthias and I were in a room and we were having a conversation and Matthias continually interrupted me and we were recording. Yeah, I do this like, sometimes because, you know. Exactly. <laughs> and so th this is really cool. This was a fun part of uh, putting this all together. Um, and we have multiple interaction, interruption um, behaviors that go on on top of this. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, we had much rougher reactions from him. And, and uh, Darren, uh, our director of the Digital Human Group, he uh, said, us, yeah, this is really uh, impolite. You don't do this. Uh, take this out in it. But this is what, what Doug did. And they, no, no, let's, let's take one that is not so offensive. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go into the next demo. Um, and this next demo is going to show some of the chatbot action. Uh, we're going to have uh, a little bit more wide ranging conversation. And we're going to show you some other cool stuff as well. Um, anything else we want to lead in with this demo, Matthias, I think? No, let's get surprised. All right, let's see how it goes. Hey, Douglas. I'd like you to meet my colleague, Matthias. I'd love to. What do you do for a living, if you don't mind me asking? I'm mainly sitting around playing with autonomous virtual humans. That sounds like a lot of fun. What kind of games do you play with your colleagues? Oh, well, um, uh, we had this nice online game we played together. That was really fun. I forgot the name, though. I think I know what you're talking about. I used to play games like that all the time when I was younger. The game was called Among Us. Thank you. I'll have to check it out. I'm always looking for new games to play. What games are you playing? Right now I'm playing Fortnite. It's a free to play game on the Epic Games launch. Nice, I'm playing Fortnite too. That's awesome. What do you like to do in your spare time? I like to watch movies. Me Tell me the weather in San Francisco. Let's see, Doug. Currently in San Francisco, it's 69 and sunny. Today, it'll be sunny with a forecasted high of 72 and a low of 47. What's my name? Your name is Doug. What's my name? Your name is Doug. Hey, what's my name? Your name is Matthias. Set language to German. Okay. Hallo, jetzt spreche ich auf Deutsch. Oh, so you can speak German. Ja, ich spreche fließend Deutsch. Ich spreche auch Französisch und Italienisch. Wie ist es mit Ihnen? I can speak German too, but I hear you can speak also other languages. Ja, du hast recht. Ich liebe Reisen. Ich war auf der ganzen Welt. Wo wohnen Sie? Well, I live in Los Angeles. Set language to French. Okay. Bonjour. Maintenant, je parle en français. That's fantastic. Uh, can you say anything else in, in, in another language? Oui, je peux dire beaucoup de choses dans d'autres langues. Je parle couramment espagnol. Set language to Spanish. D'accord. Hola, ahora hablo en espagnol. How was your day so far? Va bien. Acabo de regresar de un viaje a la playa. ¿Y usted? Set language to Mandarin. Bueno. Niao xian sai wo sai suo putong wa. I have to admit I have a little hard time to understand you now. 
wo gen ji an ting dao si ban nin nen go ti gao li ye wo de nen li. Set voice default. Ao de. How does this sound? Much easier to understand for me. I will definitely try that. Thank you so much for the advice. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Doc, do you have anything else for him to, to talk to? Because he apparently is done with me. That is unfortunate. I do not have any more advice for you. I wish you the best. Thanks, Douglas. Okay, so now you've seen some other stuff. And in fact, this is really, really work in progress. This only just started re working recently. Um, uh, the, the, while there are challenges in creating this and we're trying to surmount them all the time, it's actually really fun to see this happening in that the system that we built in order to animate the character's face actually works with other voices as well. It isn't so tied to my voice. It works the best when we feed it my voice but it, it works with other voices as well. And so we were feeding it different voices speaking different languages, and it, it kind of actually works. Um, this, this was a huge surprise to us. Uh, how did the German sound, Matthias? The, the German sounds very friendly and very polite. Um, sure, they, there's always this, this little layer of, oh, it could be a little bit more natural, but it's actually pretty clean and very easy to understand. And as you can see, we are in the middle of, of R&D, R&D in this whole language part of, of him. Now that we figured we can give him other languages very easily, we want to be able to talk in other languages to him. But this is, again, another complication. So we are still working on that. Soon it will happen, though. Yeah, and it's just, it's just another aspect of how different conversations can be. Um, hey, Douglas. What is a good conversation like? So this is some other challenge that we want to have. The audio on Zoom can be very vague. And sometimes a little noise in Zoom or a little wobble in Zoom can cause him not to hear us. So let's try that one more time. Hey, Douglas. Hey, Douglas. There we go. What is a good conversation like? A good conversation should have turn taking and an understanding of the subject matter and hopefully a sense of humor. What are some of the things you struggle with? I have a hard time understanding when people aren't speaking to me, especially on Zoom. I also don't understand when I don't hear the right words. It's hard to speak and listen at the same time. And what do people do that makes this tricky? They talk on and on and on and don't wait for answers. And they remember things for her. And they talk to fast or to softly or on top of each other. Everything basically. Thanks, Douglas. So those are just some of the challenges that we're finding. Uh, Matthias, what else? What else is going on? Well, I mean, uh, the speed, uh, if you see uh, those speeds for, for, a, for a scripted answer is very fast. If we want to get something created uh, from other bots, we are a little bit relying on their speed to create this because our speed on our end is very fast. And many things we are depending on other people's software as well because we can't develop everything like facial recognition it's a nice thing to facially recognize someone but recognizing how the mood of someone is is very dependent on how good this software is we could have implemented that he sees that i'm smiling or angry or something but we want to be really good with this so we need a system that is really reliably seeing those different moods and most systems are very rough and yeah sure this is a smile and this is angry but uh, the nuances between they're not so good most of the time. We want to avoid repetitions. We, we, we are pretty good with this already, but we could be better. We want to put in more machine learning in certain parts that are in the moment more hard-coded. And 
Yeah, Doug, I mean, there is plenty of stuff we, we still want to improve. Yeah, and, and with the repetition kind of stuff, again, we're watching a lot of people have a lot of conversations. People repeat things. It, there's only a certain number of facial expressions that you have. I know that I, I rely on the, the one raised eyebrow a lot. That is a big thing in my facial repertoire. And with me, it's kind of natural. With the computer, if he does something over again, he does it exactly the same. Or And so adding that little variation to it, adding that little noise uh, that makes it look not quite exactly the same is really important. Right, and we actually tried to put this together in a way that even though everything is motion captured, you will not see the one motion capture exactly the same way as you saw it before because we actually really mix things on top of it. So it is not precisely the same as you saw it before. And there's a lot of motion capture that it can, uh, it can choose from. Another really tricky part we have to look into, and we also tried already, but it's, it's really, really, really difficult, is dealing with multiple people in front of a camera. So right now, Zoom is usually one person, so that is kind of easy, already difficult, but easy. If you have three people understanding for the vision system and for any other system to see who's actually talking, are they talking to each other? Are they talking to the butt? Which one is which? There are so many <laughs> challenges that it's really hard to ex explain or uh, put into one sentence what this is, but it, it can break on many levels. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's that's something amazing. Like Matthias and I are talking to each other, and we know, I know exactly when he stopped talking. Um, the, and we are talking to each other, and it's very, very difficult if we don't have that trigger word of the, you know, from Douglas, uh, didn't want to say it because I'd wake him up. Um, uh, it's it's difficult for him to follow the conversation if there are multiple people in there, uh, but it's it's actually possible. I think it's possible, but it's it's really tricky. And even then, you saw he misses understands words, and when we misunderstand words, there's this part of our brain that's kind of figuring out what actually happened. So if if Matthias says something and gets garbled in Zoom, I'm actually perfectly fine moving along in the conversation, but um, it he doesn't. He responds to exactly what he has heard, and that is a real trick. Also, we um, tried to put a, a system into there that we fake him understanding that we are not talking to him. So we try to find situations where, oh, it's most likely, uh, probably the situation is right now that people are talking to each other, not to him. And we tried to time this, having certain interruption counters and all these things. And if this happens, he even if he talked to you before, he might just fall asleep again or go into his pause mode because he assumes that you are anyway not talking to him. That works quite nice, I would say 80% or so, but there's still 20% where it's just not working because it, you, you can't, he's not consciously able to understand that you're not talking to him. So you have to find right now, we have to find other tricks to trigger those things so it feels natural that he is stopping answering everything. And then the final thing that we should talk about, well, the, there's two things that we should talk about right now, is that conversational AI is in its infancy. Um, uh, the, the bots that we're using are, are very fancy, but uh, the, the ability for them to hold a concept in their heads for longer than a couple of turns of the dialogue is actually really tricky. And so this whole concept of episodic memory in conversational AI is something that I'm really, really interested in. And if you if you look at it, it's really heavily being researched at this point. It's, it's the next big thing of, if you tell him something in the conversational aspect of the AI, will he remember it the next time you see him two days from now? And uh, even if it's an offhand comment, because people can do that. And then the one last thing, of course, with all this is because we're watching people. They're telling us their names. They're telling us stuff. We are incorporating that in the behavior of the character. There are enormous implications of privacy here. We love wanting to have this as the way you communicate with computers, but also we have to be really cognizant of 
what we do with that memory, making sure that it stays within his brain and his brain only. And it makes him get better at knowing you, but not being used for evil, because uh, um, it could possibly be. Um, yeah. In any case, and I still have to say this, we are working on this thing and we are presenting it from time to time, but you really have to know that it's big fun just talking to him, even though we know there are limitations, but we just, as a person alone with him, we can just talk and talk and he's giving you funny answers and it's, it's super entertaining. It feels really like a, sometimes a little bit weird person, but like a person. So that is, that alone is a great achievement, I have to say, for myself personally, looking at this, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm I'm just as excited uh, as Matthias is on this. When you're talking with him, there is this sort of freedom of conversation, and you will say things that you would never actually uh, say to another person. But uh, he's he's just happy to talk to you. It's so much fun, and it's been a blast talking to you guys, Nvidia. Um, uh, Right now, we're going to sign off on the recording part of this and go over into the question and answer part of this. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Matthias? Bye-bye. All was right. Great. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Talk to you guys. Wow, that was incredible. Uh, thank you so much, Doug and Matthias. Uh, we're going to switch to Q&A now. Uh, we are here live with you, and there are so many amazing questions uh, in here. We won't be able to get to all of them, unfortunately. We've been trying to answer as many as we could uh, during the presentation, but let's let's hop to it. Um, I'll, I'll kick off with uh, with one because it, it really was asked, and it was, um, uh, can all of this be done with Ampere GPUs? And so I just want to mention that Digital Domain, prior to the launch of the A6000, was uh, the first studio to, to get one and test it. And so um, Doug or Matthias, are, can you, is there anything you can say about uh, the work that you've done with the A6000, and is it running uh, Auto Doug or Douglas? Are you guys on? Yeah, we're on. I think I I think Doug is better one for answering that though. Yeah, sorry, I was turning on my uh, web camera and it that cut me off here. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can okay, hear you. Um, uh, yes, the Ampere. Um, we well, we were lucky recipients to a very early A six thousand, and uh, this this card is a beast. It's enormous, and um, as you can see, speed is extraordinarily important for this character. Uh, even now, you can feel that there's a little bit of pausing between when he talks and when he goes. Uh, the more horsepower that we can throw at it, the better. Um, and you know, right now that this is a GPU CPU hungry process. And so, the A6000 has been great for training the machine learning that we've been using to drive this character. And then it's also really nice to have when we're actually running the character. It's um, kind of equally well inference and machine learning uh, training. So um, uh, yeah, the more, uh, Rick, uh, make sure that NVIDIA keeps building more powerful GPUs, okay? <laughs> yes, okay. I'll, 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 I'll be the one to make sure of that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're, we're now 19,000 strong now. So we've, we've got a lot of people working on the, on the case. So let me keep going here. So there have been a lot of questions specific to uh, languages, auto switching between languages, how many languages uh, can it know, um, and then also related, uh, just in, well, maybe not so much related, um, but maybe we can tackle that one. And then right after that, in terms of sentiment, when you're talking to the digital human, um, uh, Autodog, can it respond and will it, like if you start getting it into a heated debate, will it sound like it's in a heated debate. All right. Um, so there's lots of <laughs> lots of questions there. I'm going to go yeah. after the the language one. Um, the the language feature is relatively new. Uh, we we were we literally were get asked to give this presentation to a European client. And we thought, you know what? Uh, the way we've built this, this should actually work. And so uh, we were able to tack on 
extra language speakers. You can tell it's not my voice. Um, we've trained it with my voice, and, and this, the voice sounds a little gravelly. It's, it is my voice, but it's not quite as fluid as my voice. We're working on that. Um, but then we're using different voices because um, uh, you can get those, right? You can get them from other things. The fun thing was that the speech, the, the expressions on the character's face are being driven by the sound. And so our system that we built in order to drive the character's face was robust enough so that it could take these other languages. In fact, we have this one thing which we didn't show, which was him speaking Swedish. And the only um, voice that we could find speaking Swedish was a female voice. And my face still works on there. It's it's not as quite as snappy as when my voice drives my face, but it's, it actually works. Uh, it is weird with a um, uh, female voice coming out of my face. Now, for the sentiment, I'm going to turn that over to Matthias. He's been doing a lot of stuff with the sentiment stuff. Yeah, uh, actually, we were looking a lot into how can we change the voice of him when he's speaking um, just based on, on emotions. And we use the sentiment analysis to figure out in which emotional state he probably is in the moment. And we experimented in particular in the beginning with how fast he's speaking uh, depending on his mood and if he's more happy if he's speaking faster if he's angry if he's speaking slower and um, we know we can hook stuff up we were just not that successful to change the complete sound of the of the speaking um the melody of the speaking uh, just based on on his mood but it is all in a way hooked up in a framework that we can influence it with external information like this. We just need to find a better way to actually really change the voice with that. Yeah, uh, affecting the prosody of the voice is uh, something that the latest uh, voice synthesis is really starting to tackle. And so um, he he does talk faster. He does talk slower. He, he he'll he'll sound a little bit happier. But um, uh, we want more. We want more of that please. Great. Okay. And that we have another question here on what are the biggest challenges you face when trying to get out of the uncanny valley? Everything. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things. I think uncanny valley, that is, is something that we are confronted in film with all the time. And then when we go into real time engine, there are a couple of more layers that are coming to it. Um, the most perfect motion capture in film is perfect and you use it in some way in a real-time engine uh, any kind of strange motion already rips you out of the out of the believability and so uncanny valley is not only face it's also head motion it is eye motion it is body motion everything together the gestures and, and the wrong timing rips you out so we are trying to overcome this all the time and we have found a fairly nice way to render his face but it is a face rendered on top of um, on on a very fine animated other face where sometimes little details are rendered nicer but don't come through in terms of tiny little motions for example eye darting you will not see a lot of eye darting on on uh, Douglas yet he's actually doing it so there are we are struggling with this all the time but it is very high on our list to actually overcome it in every of these aspects, not just in one of them. Yeah, and the Uncanny Valley, it's its all about the details. Um, and once we started working on an autonomous character, we realized that in, you know, we're a visual effects company. It's all about the look of the character, but then the behavior of the character. Uh, when he mishears you um, in a normal conversation, you're because we mishear people all the time. You you miss the last word in a sentence or something like that. He doesn't understand that. And that's really tricky. Um, and, and so there's all sorts of how he responds to you that will, even if he looks perfect, it will rip you out of the um, believability <clears throat> of this because he's just crossed the uncanny valley by saying something that no other person would ever say. Um, so, Actually, yeah, yeah sometimes sometimes he uh, just uh, misunderstands. Uh, if he doesn't understand the words you're saying because they're mumbled, that's the one thing. But sometimes he doesn't understand the content, and there he is reacting on. He says, then, I don't know what you're talking about. And he usually changes his mood, and he's becoming a little bit cranky. So that's kind of funny, actually. 
but the whole acoustically uh, understanding correctly is is an issue and we are also i mean like everyone i guess in, in those things are struggling with that a little bit cool awesome uh we have another question about uh different use cases so outside of entertainment uh where does digital domain see uh digital humans being uh being used in the world well, then for us, it's the, the, the world is open for this. I think um, we're, we're on the cusp of sort of a new user interface for computers. Uh, so we've, you can think of uses for this in healthcare, in finance, in education. Uh, just think about, he was there helping us do a presentation, right? And it's really easy to load him up with what to say, load him up basically with a knowledge base. And, and even though some of that stuff was scripted, like the introduction is totally scripted, a lot of those other questions, we just sort of said, if somebody asks you about this, this is the stuff that you should say. And it, it isn't exactly a script. It's more like just telling him knowledge about stuff. So say you're a teacher and you put together a knowledge base that's based on your coursework. And, and now all of a sudden you have this digital TA working with you who can be part of the presentation, who you can refer to. You can have this TA be available to you, um, students who would ask more detailed questions. The TA would be infinitely patient. It would have a lot of knowledge and could look up other things. Um, it, what I'm saying right now, some of this is fantasy. It's, it, it will require more artificial intelligence wherewithal, but um, uh, it feels possible now. It's actually kind of cool. Excellent. And then um, there are some questions about uh, tools for constructing a knowledge base. Um, is, is there something specific that you were using or that uh, are there multiple tools that you'd recommend? Well, uh, the, the one other caveat is that uh, Digital Domain and Visual, Visual Effects Company, uh, we've only been diving into machine learning and AI uh, recently. So we knew right off the bat that uh, if we tried to keep up with the big boys uh, who are doing amazing things with AI, that would be silly. So um, like he said, uh, he's got three different chatbots that are driving his behavior. And uh, we, what we have, what we're happy with is this kind of cool thing that decides what chatbot should be generating the most appropriate response. Um, so we can tack on other chatbots. Uh, and chatbots is a very, you have the sense of chatbots, like, hey, somebody's helping me with my, my bill on, online. But, this is more like conversational AI. So there is uh, an assistant chatbot, um, a more scripted kind of knowledge-based one, and then there's the conversational AI. The thing we're working on right now is training up, the, making it easier to put in knowledge and memory into these systems so that no matter which one we're using, it will it'll know things about you and be able to answer things. So the the... The knowledge base stuff is kind of a work in progress. It's not only we're working on it, but other big companies are working on it. It'd be nice to be able to just give this guy a book and uh, say, hey, learn what's in this book. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but um, it's getting closer. Awesome. And so we're, we're a little over time here. I'm going to turn it back over to Kush to, to give everyone details on, on the draw for the RTX 5000. Um, Doug and Matthias, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And if we can answer a few more questions in the chat, that would be great. But um, there, there is another cool one I want to leave you with, and you've probably seen it. There have been multiple people asking about um, getting sign language added to uh, to a digital, digital human. So um, anyway, that, I be, love this idea. Yeah. This is absolutely awesome. brilliant. It, it seems like a, a perfect, uh, and we've already talked about this. Um, there's no real reason to do it. It's just a little bit complicated. You know, the, the sign language is another language. Um, and uh, the, there are some there are some real details that you need to do in order to get sign language to work, but um, should be possible. Matthias, uh, can we do sign language? I think uh, that should be almost easier possible than uh, the seemingly easy uh, ambient animation that is happening when he's talking in this specific pointing or something because it is a direct translation from uh, text 
to motion. So we could actually put in a machine learn um, system for that because this is the text. These are the motions for it. I think that would be possible. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks everyone, and please join us at GTC. There'll be more on digital humans there. We'll dive deeper into uh, some NVIDIA specific tech, and I'll turn it over to Kush to close out the webinar. All right, thank you everyone. This concludes today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. We've got hundreds of questions here. Uh, so be sure to fill out the survey by clicking on the feedback survey widget. And just a reminder, everyone who attended the webinar today is also entered into a drawing to win an NVIDIA Quadro RTX 5000. The winner will be picked randomly and will receive an email from us later this week. We will announce the winner on our Twitter handle at NVIDIA Design within two weeks. We hope to see you again, and thanks for tuning in today.